left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards. As usual, I cannot plan. It's simply not something built into my circuitry. This is a common problem I've had for a while now. Let's be honest here. So you are, in fact, listening to an episode that was recorded about a year ago by your calendar. Because if I had bothered to pay attention to your calendar, I would have released it a little over a year ago and been able to take advantage of the same situation I am taking advantage of right now. Because right now, by your calendar, the birthday of the great and almighty United States Marine Corps was a few days ago which all loops into the conversation we are about to have, or monologue you are about to listen to, depending on how you want to approach this. And by this, I mean, allow me to introduce you to Lloyd William Williams. Yes, his parents did, in fact, saddle him with a middle name that was not too far removed from his last name. No idea why that happened. Anyways, he was born by your calendar on June 5th, 1887, in the bustling metropolis known as Berryville, Virginia. It was neither bustling nor a metropolis. At the time, it might have had 750 permanent residents. It was a tiny-ass backwards town on the almost northern point of the Virginian province of your United States of America. It was a nothing town, let's be honest. However, when he was young, his family decided to move to Washington District of Columbia, which, as far as I can tell, is the capital city of the United States of America. And from there, he had his education, grew up to be a, I don't know, adult-like human being, and decided to attend the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, which later became Virginia Tech. Now, along the way, he decided to join the Corps of Cadets, at the Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Now, this requires some degree of explanation because, as it turns out, Virginia Tech and then Virginia Polytechnic Institute was recognized as one of the senior military colleges by federal law. In fact, Norwich University, Texas A&M University, the Citadel, the Virginia Military Institute, the University of North Georgia, and finally the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, which eventually became the Virginia Tech, are all senior military colleges by federal law. What does that mean? It's complicated. Basically, they took what would become the idea of the Reserve Officer Training Corps and somehow meshed it with the concept of the military college to begin with, such as, say, Annapolis or West Point or so forth and so on, and did something in between. Because no, these quote-unquote senior military colleges do not carry the same cachet as the actual military universities, such as the actual Naval Academy, or the actual Air Force Academy, or the actual Military Academy. But still, they hold themselves to a higher mythology than that of the ROTC units out there in the wild. For whatever reason. Well, the reason basically is that despite not actually attending an academy, these Corps of Cadets signed up for a full academy experience. 
We'll go into what that means at some point later on. In fact, we talked about what that kind of meant when we were talking about toasters some, well, now year ago, year plus ago. Regardless, Mr. Williams, who was the eldest son of Goodwin Hullings and Anne McCormick Williams, which is an interesting subversion of most of the naming systems on your planet, and who attended Western High School and graduated from there in Washington, D.C., also graduated from the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and the Corps of Cadets therein, and was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps, sometime around 1907, give or take by your calendar. As a Marine officer, as a junior Marine officer, he did normal junior Marine officer things of the time. That included being deployed to Cuba, the Philippines, and being deployed on board battleships, and even being sent to the Marine Corps headquarters back in Washington, D.C. again. He must have felt quite at home. And then, when things got kind of squirrely in a country called Nicaragua in 1912, he was sent there and saw his actual first shots fired in anger in the city of Leon. After all that, he rose up through the ranks quickly and was a captain in the United States Marine Corps by 1916. Now it's worth noting that captains in the Marine Corps are not quite the same as captains in the United States Navy. Captains in the Navy are equivalent to colonels in the Marine Corps, and that's a whole separate conversation. Anyway, shortly after 1916, predictable things happened and the United States entered World War I. And the 5th Marine Division sailed for France along with then-Captain Williams. He was assigned to command the 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. And when they arrived, they discovered that the French were for some reason retreating. The French colonel, who was in charge of the retreat, informed Captain Williams that he should also retreat. Well, I mean... Captain Williams was a Marine. How do you think that conversation went? By all reports, outside of the village of Lucie Le Bocage, Captain Williams informed the French colonel, Retreat? Hell, we just got here. That was on June 3rd, 1918. On June 11th of the same year, literally eight days later, Williams led an assault that routed the German defenders at Belle Wood near Chateau Thierry in still France. Only one of the 10 officers involved in the assault and only 16 of the 250 enlisted men involved in the assault were able to escape and survive without injury. Williams was naturally injured. Another French officer, this time a major, ordered Captain Williams to withdraw. Captain Williams cordially invited him to go to hell. Later, after he had been injured again and been gassed and been further injured further, when the medics were approaching his position, he expressly said, Don't bother with me. Take care of my good men. At that time, a certain Lieutenant Orlando H. Petty did his best to evacuate Captain Williams and his men to the point of literally carrying Captain Williams over his shoulder. Apparently, for his efforts, Lieutenant Petty was later bestowed the Congressional Medal of Honor. Yes, I did say bestowed. This is a medal you don't win. This is a medal you don't want. He got it all the same. Because, you see, a day later, Captain William succumbed to his injuries on June 12th and died. He was posthumously promoted to the rank of major and received three Silver Star citations and a Purple Heart. 
In fact, his commanding officer, Colonel Wise, put him in for the Medal of Honor and the Distinguished Service Cross, but somehow he didn't receive either, despite everything he had done. He is, by all accounts, the first individual from the United States province of Virginia to die in World War I. And, in fact, on September 12, 1919, by your calendar, an American Legion post in his hometown of Berryville, Virginia, was named in his honor. And in 1957, a new campus building at his alma mater, Virginia Tech, was named Major Williams Hall, a.k.a. Major Bill, because, I mean, that happens. But, perhaps more importantly, ever since 1914, the United States Marine Corps 2nd Battalion, 5th Regiment, has adopted the motto, Retreat Hell. In fact, since that year, the 2-5 is the most highly decorated battalion in Marine history. So why am I on this channel at this time, a year from when I recorded this, maybe, telling you about this absolutely epic level Marine who accomplished absolutely epic level things in his unfortunately short life. Allow me to introduce you to a oft-missed movie called Battle Los Angeles. This movie follows around the 1st Platoon Echo Company of, you guessed it, 2nd Battalion 5th Marines during a no-shit alien invasion. Now, you have to understand that the movie was... It was simplistic in some fashions. It had all the tropes. It had the newly minted uh, Marine second lieutenant who just got married and was all wet behind the ears. It had the old scarred battle dog who knew he was getting old and wearing out and not being able to keep up with the young kids anymore and who decided it probably was time to turn it all in. You had the four-eyed enlisted man who was just about to get married and was trying to sort all that out while still dealing with the ribbing from his fellow enlisted personnel. You even had the brother of someone who was killed under the old battle dog's command and was a little bitter about that. You even, 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 even had a recovering PTSD soldier who was still coming to terms with watching people die around him and whether or not he could actually do that again. Yes, Battle Los Angeles did have a pile of tropes built into it, and they kind of hammered you with these right at the beginning of the movie. So I kind of understand why the movie did not do particularly well with reviewers. Its exposition was a little heavy-handed. Its, its, its laying the groundwork was very heavy-handed. And after that, I imagine a lot of people just tuned right the f*** out. And then, and then, and then, they missed something fascinating. Because even without talking about the whole alien invasion aspect of the movie... It had small unit tactics. It had the consequences of not doing proper small unit tactics. It had sacrifice. It had decisions. It had choices and the consequences thereof. This movie, this poorly received movie, might be one of the best science fiction representations of your United States Marine Corps. I shit you not. Perhaps the best example of this is when a particular situation happened, and uh, along the way, the Marines picked up a United States Air Force intelligence asset who was shockingly heavily armed and armored for what she was doing. But that's beside the point. The point is they picked her up, she had a gun, and she could fight. So welcome to the party, gal. 
And along the way, they encountered some heavy resistance from the aliens who were invading. And their commanding officer directed them to take up a position on top of a wrecked uh, garbage truck. And the Air Force servicemen figured out why not help out. So she, along with two other Marines, were setting down suppressive fire against the aliens. Well, the aliens being the aliens, they were getting the upper hand quite rapidly. And the commanding officer realized it was time for those people on top of the garbage truck to leave. And the two Marines removed themselves from the top of the garbage truck and prepared to unass themselves from the top of the garbage truck. Except the Air Force serviceman was stuck. Her gear, her harness, her uniform, whatever, got snagged on some portion of the roof of the garbage truck. So one of the Marines stayed behind. He yanked her physically off the garbage truck and then threw her clear right as the rockets from the aliens hit the garbage truck and killed him. He knew what was coming. He had been warned by a superior officer and he could see it for his own self. And he stayed behind. He didn't have to. He could have left that Air Force serviceman to die. Instead, he saved her. Because that's what fucking Marines do. Don't bother with me. Take care of my good men. Am I right? And this theme continued throughout the movie. In fact, we lost a lot of 1st Platoon, Echo Company, 2nd Battalion's 5th Marines. But the point is, we did not lose them in vain. Their sacrifices accomplished many, many things along the course of their very brief mission in the defense of Los Angeles. Which is one of my points. Someone writing this movie was paying attention to specifically which actual battalion they were writing about. They understood some modicum of the history and wrote the story to fit. They wrote a story that was proper and deserving of Major Williams' sacrifice. And, naturally, your critics panned the movie. Because your critics do not like movies that involve sacrifice. Your critics do not like movies that involve heroes doing heroic things. We've talked about this before. It is a goddamn shame. Oh, sure, oh, sure, we can do superhero movies this and superhero movies that. But average, honest-to-God, normal human beings suddenly standing up and saying, I will do this, no matter the cost. That's not something that goes over well with your critics. And you should really ask yourself the question of why. Well, maybe you should. You won't actually like the answer. Regardless, the movie is an outstanding example of what Marines can be and what Marines, when they set their minds to it, can do. They are a terrifying force. Your United States is no doubt happy that the Marines are on the United States side. Probably wouldn't prefer it any other way. But in terms of more specific things to this particular channel... Well, honestly, the movie comes up a little short. Apparently, the aliens invaded Earth for its water. Really? Water? You can't find salt water anywhere else in the solar system, much less the rest of the f***ing galaxy. There are literal thousands, if not millions, of comets in the solar system, in the terrestrial human solar system, that are literal frozen water. Go snag one of those, heat it up, grab the water, go home. This is not hard. And on top of that, apparently water is a power source? It's not how water works. It takes more energy to crack the atomic bonds between the individual hydrogen and oxygen atoms than you get back out of burning them. The burning the byproducts of cracking the bonds, that is. Burning the hydrogen and oxygen. 
you you lose energy naturally because entropy entropy always wins but still water is not a power source and yet this movie claims it was because aliens can't find water anywhere else okay we're just going to skip right past that point the really interesting thing about the aliens is i would like to point out that this movie came out in 2011 by your calendar and the aliens mostly f prosecuted their war against earth by way of a distributed mesh drone network uh they did have ground troops who were frankly terrifying and appeared to be like biologically meshed with their mechanical weapons and exosuits and some other stuff but their air assets were all drone based and it was a mesh drone system. Sure, there was a central hub that controlled all the drones, and that was a problem later on in the movie, but the drones themselves worked together in small units. They, they literally interconnected and then separated to take care of little stuff and came back together again. And they intercommunicated, and they all operated on a, as I keep saying, a mesh network. You should probably look that up if you don't know what it means. I do not have the words to adequately describe it to you. The point is that 11 of your years ago, someone saw the writing on the wall about how you would be prosecuting wars in the very near future. Hopefully, the conflict in Eastern Europe that is still transpiring at the time that I am recording this episode has resolved by the time this episode airs, but that conflict all the same allowed you Humi Squishies to experience just how terrifying drone warfare could be. Now imagine drone warfare on the scale where the drones can talk to each other and coordinate with each other, and you can give an entire like fleet of drones a set of instructions, and they can figure out which drones are best suited to accomplish which individual instruction needs to be accomplished. This is how the aliens in Battle Los Angeles prosecuted the war, aside from, again, their very terrifying ground troops who were remarkably durable and basically had individual rocket launchers that seemed to have unlimited ammunition. The aliens cheated on a lot of points. But the point, to shift the meaning of the point, is the Battle Los Angeles may not be a good movie. I am not a good judge of whether or not it is a quote-unquote good movie. It is a more accurate movie about the quality and substance of your average Marine Corps individual than a lot of movies are. And it is a very fair representation of what the 2nd Battalion 5th Marines probably like to believe they are. And beyond that, Battle Los Angeles is a thought movie, even though it's filled with explosions and gunfights and aliens. It showed very fairly the horror, the terror, the lack of information that will come from aliens landing on your planet and deciding you shouldn't be there anymore. It showed civilians being evacuated and failing. It showed the consequences of warfare. It showed the consequences of failure. It showed the consequences of doing the right thing at the right time and still losing. It was honest and it was brutal and it was in your face. And the funny thing is, like I said, aside from the interstellar travel aspect, the aliens who invaded were not significantly more advanced than you are right now. They were basically a parody-level enemy. But there's still the catch of, they came from the sky. How ready are you for that? Would it change your perception of the enemy? How would it change your perception of the enemy? Or would you, like the 1st Platoon, Echo Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, say, retreat? Hell! We just got here. And that's all from Sacred Cow Shipyards. Please be advised that any ship left on the docks for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Have a nice day.